the incredible Jill Tucker of the CMA Foundation, who has been uh, at the forefront of pushing um, on a reform agenda to make fashion a force for good. It's a real pleasure to be doing this event with Jill tonight at the CMA Foundation. So I'll turn it over to you, Jill, for your duties as moderator of this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Amal, and welcome, everyone. Um, as Amal said, I'm head of the Labor Rights Program at CMA Foundation. Um, CNA Foundation is focusing on systems changing ideas and programs that have the potential to really change the status quo in the apparel industry, the global apparel industry. And because of that, uh, I'm really delighted to be here talking about purchasing practices because we feel that this is absolutely fundamental to change, um, to change the, the industry for better. Um, we all know a lot about, I think a lot of us know a lot about the problems with purchasing practices. Uh, so we're not going to spend as much time on the problems tonight. We will be talking about some of the problems. Uh, but we really want to focus on possible solutions. Um, some of the problems we all know about is that when um, orders are canceled or rejected at a late date, then this makes it very difficult for the manufacturer to pay their workers, or when large orders come in um, very late as well because uh, a style is very popular, then workers are working excessive overtime. I mean, there's so many examples of how um, challenging purchasing practices can lead to poor working conditions. Um, but let's focus as much on the solutions as we do on the problems. The panelists are going to speak for about um, about 30 minutes, and then we're going to be uh, posing some questions to you, the audience, as well as the panelists, and then we would like questions um, that you have for the panelists. So I'll start off, I think you know Aruna, who, who wrote this work. Uh, this, I think this is the best title of a report that I have heard <laughs> this year, so thanks Aruna for that title. She's senior counsel at Human Rights Watch, and my brother, Mustafa Bizudin, who owns a, a factory in Bangladesh. But more than that, is extremely active in talking about not only this issue, but other issues um, with, within the global apparel industry. And of course, Jennifer from OECD, policy advisor um, in textile and garments in the Responsible Business Conduct Unit at OECD. So we'll start with Aruna. Um, Aruna, your report places a clear spotlight on purchasing practices um, in the apparel sector. And I just mentioned a few examples. There are obviously many more examples of how purchasing practices can do harm. So what I'm wondering is, as you were re researching the report, did you see these examples and more? More importantly, what surprised you? You know a lot about purchasing practices. What surprised you as you were researching this report? Thank you, Jill. One of the things, I mean, and, and just to clarify that the title of the report is taken from a quote uh, from a supplier, an Indian supplier I spoke with at length. One of the things that was surprising to me as I was researching the report was actually, um, you know, brands that have a lot of rhetoric around rights and how they're very committed to reducing and mitigating the risks to labor abuses in their own supply chains don't understand that they're actually a whisker away from a disaster because of purchasing practices. Mm -hmm. That is literally, I mean, because there's, if, if you start speaking to brands, the alarm bells literally ring if they hear the word, the phrase unauthorized subcontracting. Mm -hmm. But so much of their own purchasing practices are actually drivers of unauthorized subcontracting. They're sitting on liability and don't actually take that seriously. That to me was seriously surprising. So we're literally, I mean, we just need two or three cases that will drive home these points and then, and, and then you know, the, the entire industry will start to take it more seriously. Right now, I think they're just getting lucky with how much they're able to get away with. I mean, with that, there were, there were numerous examples. I mean, it was, I mean, the suppliers that I spoke with and, and the industry experts, when I say industry experts, I mean people who have spent decades doing sourcing. Uh, for some of the top brands in the industry. Um, they're all quite candid about what was going wrong in the industry. There was no, there was no sense of 
hiding anything. It was like an open secret, and that to me was also, I wasn't surprising as much as the, the cynicism around it, um, around how much needs to change and how little gets done, because nobody wants to actually do anything about it. Um, so with that, I just, there was a, the numerous stories, numerous stories, like literally suppliers, you, you go in for an interview and you think they, typically an interview would last an hour. I had days with multiple conversations, with example after example after example. I mean, some of these, I mean, jokes, there were, there were lots of designer jokes, brand jokes, you know, black is not black enough, send the sample eight times, nine times, and then they approved the second block, the black sample that came in without giving additional time. Uh, so there were, there were lots of humor to pepper all these stories, but I think the, um, and, and also there was lots of anecdotal evidence, like one of the jokes around in the industry, at least in India, is that a lot of the suppliers who go out of business because of unscrupulous brands are actually doing the, the, uh, the temple circuit, going to different pilgrimages, because that's, that's where the suppliers run away to hide, because they've shut down their factories. So the joke was that if you want to go do research, you go on the pilgrimage circuit and you find the suppliers there, because they can't afford to pay. Um, so one of the, for example, I'll give you, so one of the top drivers, of course, everybody here, I think, are experts in the field, so they know pricing is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, and what to me was, again, coming back to the su surprise factor was how bad it was. You know, they would say, like, this is like buying eggs for them. Mm -hmm. There's no question of a negotiation. And it was also, for me, you imagine that going in, if there's a business relationship with somebody for over a decade, that they're committed to being a fair partner. But what, again, to me was interesting was that they would continue to do business, but they didn't find any need to be a fair partner at all. Mm. And that they would literally, and, and, and over here, I think uh, one of the downsides of the research in terms of being able to build trust with suppliers was also being very clear that we wouldn't ask questions about specific brands, so no brand names were actually discussed. <laughs> but it, it, what became clear was that um, at least the, the, the US brands <coughs> tended to be far more harder on prices uh, in terms of their negotiation strategies uh, than the European brands. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was interesting was uh, even in price negotiation, that there was zero, that, that their codes, every single code of conduct uh, that you read will say that the supplier is responsible for you know, these rights conditions. But that the basic commitment to pay a price that factors in legal minimum wage. We're not talking about living wage. We're talking about legal minimum in a country. Even when, when those statutory wages are increased by the government, it is lacking, which is, which is again, to me, was quite surprising. Um, and the third thing that, that I feel that hasn't gotten enough attention, that needs a lot more attention in the industry, is the use of buying agents. Not all brands use them. How they structure their business, to what extent they use buying agents, what kinds of buying agents, and where the oversight is, there's not a whole lot of a conversation around it yet. And I think that needs to become a central piece of purchasing practices. Um, and, the, and the fourth thing I would say, and, and this is where I think UK has actually a positive example, and I'm, I'm familiar with at least one or two brands that are doing this, is you know, how can we match regulatory frameworks? Because there's very little appetite for actual regulation of this. Mm -hmm. But there is at least some, it, it's not mandatory, but the UK Prompt Payment Code is the kind of example of what governments can do to encourage good practice. So the Prompt Payment Code actually says you have to pay, I mean, you encourages companies to pay within the UK, but also there are companies that are doing this across their supply chains outside of the UK within a particular date and they encourage within 60 days. So it's, it's sort of there's, there's good practices there. Uh, one of the things that I think that doesn't get any attention at all, and this was came through again in conversation with suppliers, is that the terms and conditions written in purchase orders, um, or there are very few manufacturing agreements in the industry, but over the terms and conditions of purchase orders, even if it is just a theoretical term which is unreasonable, put such tremendous pressure on the supplier that they start to make calculations. And the, off, the calculation that was often made was air freight or overtime, and overtime hands down. It's much cheaper to work workers, hire workers on short term basis, daily wage workers, as well as overtime. So these kinds of calculations in the business are very common. And, and the idea that there isn't 
a whole lot of attention given to the terms and condition of purchase orders, um, and that even from a purely you know PR branding exercise, it's surprising to me why a brand would actually have a legally written up document that is so unfair, uh, which would actually expose them. If, if they just need to get caught in one litigation, and somebody needs to produce a copy of appeal, and it will just show they've taken zero measures on paper legally to mitigate risk. And that, that again to me was surprising. Like I couldn't understand why in-house counsel wouldn't clamp down and make sure these are fair, simply to make sure that the brand, even, even if it's just to show that there are very serious steps the brand's taking uh, to cut down unauthorized subcontracting through, its, through being a fair business partner. Um, and, and finally, I think one of the greatest myths around this is that there can be no transparency. You know, the idea that anything about purchasing practice so it's commercially sensitive. Mm. We can't talk about this because, oh, this is all commercially sensitive, but there's anti-competition law. Uh, there's this build up to secrecy, which actually, when you come to think of it, is not true. And I want to cite Fair Web Foundation's work here, and to some extent, the Fair Labor Association's work, because they have been writing about purchasing practices. The Fair, uh, Fair Web Foundation actually has a brand performance check which does provide you know, information about purchasing practices of individual brands. Um, it, it may not, you know, there's a lot of scope for improvement there, but they've been consistently doing it. The Fair Labor Association provides narrative description of brands purchasing practices publicly. It just takes a lot of effort to sit and go through all of that information, but it's there. Um, and those are big US brands. I mean, there's anti-competition law there. Uh, so, and there's, European law here. So I feel like this is an area that there is some transparency and there needs to be more. It's just a question of putting our heads together and sort of doing, you know, being able to be creative about what we demand as, as information for activists um, and experts in the area to see how brands are progr to making progress in this area. So I would say there's what can be done and that that's the hopeful message for me. That, uh, it, it's, you know, transparency is not a non-starter. <clears throat> it is a difficult conversation, but it's a, it's one that should be had today, and I hope we can have it in this room. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Aruna, and shout out to the Fairware Foundation. Mustafi <laughs> 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 um, Zudin, uh, you are a supplier in the supply chain of global apparel brands, and recently you wrote this article and you recount a specific negative experience of one of your friends in the industry. I'm wondering if you can just briefly describe um, that experience of your friend, but also tell us, is this case typical in your experience or is this really an outlier? Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jill, my sister, who invited me over here, and thanks, Olivia, uh, for inviting me over here. Thanks for the Freedom Fund, and thanks to all the audience. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be here. When uh, Aruna was telling all the experiences about this, I was thinking where I am sitting. This is the first time in my life I am hearing what I hear every day. <laughs> so I'm just thinking I'm sitting in Bangladesh, I'm sitting in London. <laughs> uh, I've written a lot of your things, and I'm, I just, before telling these things, I'll just look like a brief. I'm from Bangladesh, I own a factory. I'm running factory around 20 years. Apart from that, I'm a sustainable level, uh, business uh, practice promoter and also transparency. Um, about the incident of uh, uh, example of bad purchasing practices, it comes to me quite often, and it's not the first time it came to me. But why particularly I had written the article about it? Um, quite often I write an article, when I am so helpless, when I knock every door, I cannot do anything, <coughs> then I just put an article in LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, by the grace of all might I have a very big number of followers, and good numbers of people follow me. And very often I get a good result. So when I came here, I see the article, I got so much uh, pleased about it. Particularly these cases made me very sad. Uh, why it made me very sad? Uh, one of the gentlemen came to me and he said it to me, Mustafa, you are speaking all over the world, uh, uh, wherever you're going to Copenhagen, New York, here, there, talking about sustainability, everything. Uh, I want your help. I said, okay, please tell me what happened. 
and he explained his problem of the purchasing practices. So one of the company in Europe got bankrupt and once they got uh, bankrupt, before that the supplier had sent the goods to Europe already. So his goods was lying to the uh, port and he don't know that the company got the bankrupt. So it's, they are not getting paid and the festival bonus is coming. We need to have paid the festival bonus to the worker. The factory is getting nervous where they will get the money. But they also don't know that the uh, buyer got bankrupt. Anyway, uh, after 20 days, the goods lying on the port, they came to know that the goods got, uh, uh, company got bankrupt and they will not get the money. So they said, okay, what can we do in this situation? I said that, okay, let me uh, try to help you and let me try to communicate with the people. And throwing my, uh, all these connections, being, talking in Copenhagen Summit and all these places, I got to know a lot of important people, a lot of governmental people, a lot of high official people, and I start to writing everybody. Hey guys, this happened, this happened, this happened. When, when between when I'm writing to everybody for the help of him, one day one male came to me, he said that, uh, uh, I'm, I've been offered for 50% discount of the goods and I have to send the goods by year. Uh, I said, why? When, when it goes to the bankrupt and the company is not there, then why they still need to uh, purchase the goods and why you need to send the goods by the year? He said that, you know, stuff is this is the organization three years back also did something like that. I said, really? Tell me, tell me more about it. And I came to know that organization had been the same thing three years back also and after that once he declared the bankruptcy after three or four months he again bought that company mm -hmm. so I, then i said that okay what is the plan and he said that the plan is like this this organization will again buy all these goods and then, then after some day in europe maybe they will buy their company i again started to writing to the ministry to to many people organizations ngos all over the connections i know <sighs> It made me very sad that uh, nothing happened over there. And finally the supplier was saying, okay, what can I do? I have to pay to the worker. If I don't pay to my worker, we, we are in, in trouble. And then we need to, the worker need to have the festival. You know, this is a very big thing for us. I said, okay, maybe I can do anything. And he accepted the 50% discount. Not only the 50% discount, but also he had to send all the goods by air on his own cost. Not only the 50% discount. And uh, the goods are uh, uh, the, the same uh, brand had been bought this one. So what uh, made me very sad that this brand and retailer had done the things three years back also the same thing. So where is the law and order? I just want to ask one question to all of you. We have 4,000 factories in Bangladesh. Today in one factory, one glass broke and tomorrow it is in BBC. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened about this, this incident? The person had did this one, he's a very famous person. He having two, three brands, many, many shops in Europe and very proudly, loudly, he is keep on doing the business. Where are we in this world? Where are we? What is happening? So what Aruna had explained about um, the issues, um, uh, I'm not wanted to go about all these issues, but it break my heart that which world we are, we are living. And after locking so many doors, after I've been communicating with so many important persons, all of you interested to discuss with me personally, please discuss with me. I'm a very transparent guy. I'm not fair on anything. I will give you the name, addresses, person, everything. <laughs> but I would like to say to you, nothing happened to him. And maybe within two months, he will bought the company again. And he will again start in this business. So I think we all have to wake up for humanity reason. We all have to, it's time that uh, we uh, address those issues and we bring out in front of everybody. And thanks for uh, Freedom Fund and Jim to arrange such kind of thing that I at least got an opportunity to uh, speak something what three months I did on. I was so much frustrated. I was thinking that should I leave this business? What I am doing? Why I am doing this one? Because of many people in Bangladesh, they, they think that, okay, he is talking in Copenhagen Fashion Summit, he is doing this, he is the, uh, he is the member of uh, United Nations Life, it's so, so many, so what, what value am I able to create? Nothing. So what I am doing, I'm so I'm asking myself, thanks for your <laughs>
was it 2013 or 14 before any of us were really talking that much about purchasing practices, maybe it was before, he had a website called claims.org, it's not there anymore, I worked with Tim in the back, where they <coughs> actually encouraged apparel manufacturers to, to list their problems, and they actually tried to solve them. They, it was just a service out of the kindness of his heart where he was solving problems for his friends in the apparel industry. So thanks for doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Jennifer, the OECD has helped set frameworks and guidelines. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have purchasing practices in your guidelines? And um, how, how do you deal with this issue in the, in the OECD? Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's, it's really such a privilege. And um, congratulations for such an excellent report on, on purchasing practices. So I think we, you opened, Jill, by saying that we, we do know what the problem is and that we're no longer negotiating on whether purchasing practices is important, or at least we shouldn't be negotiating whether purchasing practices is important. And at the same time, coming from the OECD perspective, we're no longer negotiating whether companies have a responsibility to carry out, to carry out responsible purchasing practices. That has been negotiated. And so what the OECD, what role we play is that we bring governments, business, trade unions, and civil society to the same table to say, what are the expectations of companies? And through that process, it takes a very long time. Um, it took two years in our case of developing a due diligence guidance for the garment sector. But through that time, we were able to definitively say, yes, companies have, just like they have responsibility under the OECD or the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to carry out due diligence on their suppliers along their supply chain, they also have a responsibility to carry out due diligence on their own internal purchasing practices. And even more than that, and this is where um, I think it, we can, it can get a little scared for companies, but it's really important to note, even more than that, companies can actually um, have a responsibility in providing access to remedy in cases where their purchasing practices have actually caused or contributed to harms in their supply chain. So they don't, they're no longer just linked to those <coughs> issues. They actually could be on the hook for providing financing or providing the, um, the response in those cases of abuses. And I think it's uh, really important that we have that framework in our minds that this is a responsibility of companies. <coughs> I did want to just quickly flag though, what are those responsibilities? I won't go through all of the many, many detailed, um, excellent, that ETI and Fairer Foundation that others have done. But I think it's important to note that there's, this can be broken up into three different areas. So the first is that companies have a responsibility in their due diligence, so in identifying how they have risks in their supply chain, to address, to assess whether their purchasing practices are contributing to issues in their supply chain. And ways they should be doing that is engaging with suppliers in a meaningful way or they're getting feedback from those suppliers in a way that they, they can hear it. Um, they should be tracking relevant indicators. There are many in this room, and I'm looking at some of them, who have already developed the indicators of what contributes to harm in the supply chain. We know them. Um, there's, there's, we know them whether it's technical specifications, whether it's not fencing wages and, and uh, price negotiations, et cetera. And so there are indicators that can be tracked to determine whether or not a company is um, has responsible or irresponsible practices. And then thirdly, a company should be understanding, well, why do we have these practices? Is it inefficiencies? What is, what is driving it? So that's the first level of responsibility. The second is that more than just tracking, companies need to have control measures to make sure that they're able to address those issues. And that can be over time that they start to address the more severe ones. And then finally, um, I think we need to be realistic and say, yeah, things are going to happen. It might be that an order is changed or a, um, a, a design is changed, but then there needs to be a system with the supplier in understanding what happens because of that. And so these are the responsibilities of a company under a negotiated international standard for companies on diligence. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we want to ask this of the audience first, and hopefully some of you 
you would be brave enough to respond, and then we'll ask of the panel as well. Um, we often hear that uh, one buyer or one brand can't buck the system on their own, that you need to do this as a collective if you're going to really change purchasing practices. So we want to ask you in the audience, can one brand address purchasing practices, start to address purchasing practices on their own, or does it have to be a collective? Yay, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think, um, do you want to introduce uh, yeah, Martin Lovell from the ETI, I lead our work on purchasing practices. Um, there are obviously collective things that brands need to do together. Um, there's the ACT initiative, which is trying to raise wages across different countries through sector-wide collective bargaining agreements. But actually there's a huge amount that individual companies can do. And we've been working with an organization called Better Buying, which is a, a cloud-based data platform where suppliers can provide um, feedback for, um, for companies on their individual purchasing practices. And then we're taking that data and working with the brands on this, at a strategic level to try and address the issues that the suppliers have identified. And I mean, we could talk at length about um, the different observations from that, but I, I would just like to pick out a few things. So the silos, um, the commercial teams, and the buyers are often very unaware of what the ethical trade teams are doing, um, and um, they are incentivized in one particular set of ways. Um, and often there's no incentivization for them to be doing anything on them, making sure that uh, they're working in a constructive manner with their suppliers. Uh, there's a whole set of issues around the business model and the way that the, um, the people who are setting the, the target margins for the buyers are setting margin and, and that becomes the, the main incentive for the buyers. So there's a lot that you can do by working with the senior teams within the commercial companies um, to, to raise awareness of what these issues are and to set a different strategic direction. Thank you. Hi, I'm um, Matthew Angwell, I'm a professor at the University of Oxford, um, and uh, I agree with <laughs> my, my colleague here in that um, there's lots that firms can do on their own. About three years ago, the FLA came to me and a colleague and asked us to try to figure out how they could evaluate their members' purchasing practices to see if they were complying. They really had no idea. Um, we spent about a year and a half studying one particular company, and we found that they had completely failed to align their purchasing practices with their compliance programs. Uh, we published this paper. It's coming out in an academic journal. I'm happy to circulate it. Um, and since then, we've been doing research on another company that has partially aligned its purchasing practices precisely by breaking down the silos and by creating goals within the commercial practice that those merchants to reduce pressures on factories. They've partially done it, um, but our research has shown that it actually made factories improve. We can show causally that that has made a difference. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about ways in which academics can under uh, can analyze these dynamics to bring out good practices that then activists can advocate for and uh, companies can, can diffuse. Uh, I'll make one comment, and that is that the Fair, I think many of you know that the Fair Labor Association um, recently became the first, I think the first MSI to require their members, their apparel members, to disclose their first tier supply chain. Uh, but we really <coughs> want to ask them to require um, themselves to disclose their brand score sheets for those same for those same members. That would be a step in the right direction. Ben. Thank you very much, uh, Ben Hopkinson. I work uh, for the Team Clothes Campaign. We have a natural inclination to say, of course, brands can move uh, at their own position. So, uh, for example, for those who uh, may or may not have seen, we have uh, had quite an intense focus on H&M and living wages, where H&M, in response to the pressure that we put on them, said, yeah, but if we start paying living wages in our supply chain, we would create a bubble of fairness. So we responded to that, yeah, in that bubble of fairness, it would be like one of the four million people living, which is 
figure that across all the Like, there is, I we would naturally be inclined to say, yeah, a company has a lot to, to offer, especially a company like H&M, who is in specific factories for 100% of the volume with a five-year commitment. At that junction in time, in that situation, it, it is quite logical. The problem, however, is, and, and here I'm probably um, going to um, opine a bit in a way that I hope not a few will tell my colleagues. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, is, is to a certain extent I do also understand why, why brands have that feeling to want to move together because not everybody is automatically in every single factory with that H&M position. Even H&M is sometimes, sometimes a minority buyer and, and I, we could understand or at least I could understand uh, why you want to move there only if uh, certain others move. Even to the extent that uh, recently in debates about uh, legislation in Germany uh, where normally companies, if they are moving towards supporting legislation for mandatory human intelligence, tend to say, well, oh, we want that because of uh, ensuring if we do something, there's no competitive disadvantage. But there was one company who sort of turned around and he said, well, we're doing this much and we think it's the maximum we can do be, uh, in, in the current um, setup without being uncompetitive vis-a-vis -vis or direct competitors who are in the same market segment or in the same uh, pricing segment. But we also do realize that what we're doing is not sufficient and in order to actually come to a level where we think we should be going, we need actually to raise the bar for everybody. So they didn't see it as negative, but they actually saw it as, as an empowering uh, move. So I do understand that, that uh, a number of companies in a number of factories or in a number of situations do need to have that, do face that collective action program, uh, problem and we need to actually move together in one way or another. The only problem is that it's not going to e be easy to sort of get all of the brands of the world to unite in a room, um, even in a country like, like Bangladesh, who would be the big, 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 big place to cover all these brands, let them, to agree, let them agree on something and be accountable on that. So I think that's where we then see again that role for, for the legislator. Mm -hmm. But I think in the meantime, it doesn't absolve individual brands to start charting their own roadmap and see what they can already do. So I would be much more mixed than the previous uh, uh, speakers, um, which I think is not our no. usual <laughs> line of business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if uh, anybody on the panel wants to answer that question. Um, yeah, um, I, I think it's it's uh, you know it's not either or. I think it needs to be both. Uh, brands can do a lot by themselves. Um, outside of the wage issue, for example, order placements, how their contracts are, um, how they structure their supply chain, how long their tail end is, whether they use buying agents. These are not dependent on collaborations at all. These are all individual brand decisions, business decisions a brand makes, which they can they can do on their own. They're not looking at collaboration at all. Um, their payment terms, uh, advance payments, whether they pay forty percent advance just to incentivize. Do they? One of the things that I asked brands, you know, there, there's a lot of again, we're for industrial relations. Great. Do you know how much of your supply chain? has unionized workers. No, actually, we don't look at that parameter. How not? I mean, is anything in your supply chain structured around freedom of association uh, and collective bargaining? Um, short of waiting for that ideal of industry-wide collective bargaining, yes, that's great. We, we, we want that to happen. But there is a stage-by-stage -stage process in while waiting for industry-wide collective bargaining to bear fruit, I think individual brands can start tracking freedom of association um, and collective bargaining in factories, which they don't do. Um, and so it, it's kind of like on the one hand, you're waiting for the ideal, but what an individual brand can drive and drive within their business is not being done. So I think that needs to be a combination, a smart combination of both. And I'd say 60 to 70% of that can be achieved by individual brands um, in their own supply chains. I think the tricky thing is, 
you know, inf like a supplier told me, for example, like one of the biggest brands came to them and said, we want to pay living wages, but it's like if you book 30%, that's, and let's say, you know, 30% you, of the production lines will have a living wage, and the remaining won't. That's why collaboration matters, because no brand wants to pay for the food factory. Um, so the wage issue is a little bit more tricky, but like Ben said, if they're booking volume by majority or 100%, and then very easily influence the wages in a factory as well. Uh, oh, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. Well, just to play a little bit devil's advocate on this one, because I'm seeing the discussion going very strongly in the independent, but that we present by yourself and you agree with. I think that it's true that there's a lot of the actions that companies can take by themselves, and they've been listed. But, what have companies done in this sector by themselves that has worked sustainably by itself? Over everything, ever any issue that we have tackled, what has worked when a company has gone out there and done it by themselves? And I think the reason that it doesn't always work is because there's an accountability mechanism that is not there in the current, in the current framework. Um, I know we're gonna get to incentives so we can talk about accountability, but I think in an ideal world, yes, there are actions that individual companies can take but they need accountability to make sure they're taking those actions. And oftentimes that's what comes in a, um, a collective agreement framework, is that accountability measure to say, well, are you taking that action? And of course that's what um, MSI is a role that they can also play. <coughs> so just to, to throw that in there. Uh, Olivia and then the fellow at the back. Sorry. Olivia, uh, Olivia go ahead. Um, Oh, I got anyway. um, I'm Olivia from CNA Foundation, um, and I would just like to say, um, I really, you said there's no appetite for legislation, um, and I just want to question that, uh, perhaps, again, like Jennifer played devil's advocate. Um, people often say there's no appetite for legislation, or let's just do this, or let's just do that. There is a very good example within the EU of an unfair trading practices directive with blacklisted behaviours, grey-listed behaviours, and a system of accountability and actual liability for this. And whenever I mention this to anyone, mm -hmm. the appetite is ravenous. <laughs> People want to be regulated. People want this to be regulated. They want it to be called out, and they want that to be done. And they want it to be a level playing field, because like Ben said, you can only go so far on your own, and I believe that. So my question really to the panel is, what, where is the lobby for that? What do we do collectively if you, if you believe in that to make that happen? And can that be something we maybe collectively start to let, you know, right now? Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Luke from Kumi. Um, so I spent a lot of time in leasing rooms with suppliers and brands. The brands have said, we will pay you more. Raise your prices and we'll pay you more. And suppliers very rarely do it. And I mentioned this because I think, in terms of collective movements, if suppliers also came together and said the BGMA, BG and the A in Bangladesh and Cambodia as a factory association could come together and set minimum criteria for accepting certain forms of contracts, maybe not pricing, lead times, payment terms, amongst each other, and rebalance the power slightly, then you would get brands to listen because just doesn't seem to work, particularly when you're looking at US, EU, you know, whatever legislation, and all the companies that we don't speak about underneath. Supplies these pushbacks on that. And, and that is something that Rosanna <coughs> Huck, the new president of the BTA, has talked about um, uh, minimum prices for, for products. Um, I'm wondering, so we've heard some of the uh, incentives there might be for buyers to change their purchasing practices. I mean, the reality is if there isn't a very strong incentive, it's not gonna happen. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's the right thing to do. So we've heard about legislation, possibly unfair trading practices directive. What are other compelling incentives for brands to change their purchasing practices? Incentives that perhaps an organization like the CNA Foundation can support. Rachel Wilshaw, Oxfam. Hi. Um, so I think one of the things that 
DNA Foundation could support, and many others in this room, would be um, uh, advocating to governments that the minimum wages are much closer to a living wage. Um, I think this would make a huge difference for workers, not only in export supply chains, but in local supply chains as well, and disproportionately benefits women. Um, and I think that that would do a great deal to overcome the, the huge problem of in-work poverty in power supply chains, um, but also enable governments to continue to compete with each other since they have to do that in a global world. But if everybody is achieving a, a, a minimum wage closer to a living wage, around the world, then everybody benefits and competition can continue. I do, I mean, I've worked a lot on the issue of a living wage and purchasing practices, not in the garment sector so much, but in the tea sector. And it's even where you, you get buyers who are, who are buying 50% of a sector, as we're, we have the situation in Malawi, it's still incredibly difficult to raise wages. We, 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 over three years, we've closed the living wage gap by about 25%, primarily through collective, removing barriers to collective bargaining. We've come up with a novel tool to enable buyers to contribute to close the living wage by another 20, 25%. But the market has taken a downturn, commodity market, uh, you know, prices have collapsed. These are kind of really, really systemic um, issues. And even brands with a will cannot even collectively overcome the power of a commodity market. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Buck Gum is not quite a commodity market, but anyway, <clears throat> I think I, I, I'm increasingly coming around to the idea that the International Trade Union Confederation has the right idea that minimum wages should be a living wage, that companies should get behind that ask, institutions with the right intentions like CMA Foundation should get behind that ask, and we can really make a difference for millions of workers in the space of a few years. Thank you. How about Trevor, and then I'd like to ask Ms. Yes. Kunal uh, from Um I think what could intensify brands to improve purchasing practices, in my view, is transparency. Transparency of the brand's purchasing practices. And this is something that we in at Fair Foundation have been doing for, for many, many years uh, with our Fair Remember brands. And really assessing them on a yearly basis on you know what are they doing indeed through their purchasing practices <coughs> to improve working conditions and making that transparent uh, and giving them uh, a, a public report that goes on the website uh, for everybody to see and i think that is really helping that is really encouraging the brands to uh, to improve uh, there's also a lot of peer pressure among brands of course and um, so I think that is one way, and you know other other ways, of course, initiatives like better buying, etc., where we really sort of put the focus on purchasing practices and making those transparent. I think are really are really key. So more effort in this regard uh, related to transparency. I agree. Better buying should be transparent by brands. <laughs> 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 Um, can I, I, I want to make just one last point, sorry, it's me twice, um, and I am from CNA Foundation, which is embarrassing. Um, I, I personally feel as though what changed my perspective and what made me feel very, very passionate about this issue when I came into the industry is because I was kind of like, you know, obsessed with like worker voice. And then I realized that the voice missing in the industry is supplier voice. <coughs> and these stories that I didn't know that I would hear in all these rooms that we sit in in Bangladesh and Cambodia and everywhere else, and last night, Mostafis posted about this event, and I said a com I put a comment underneath, and I said, we're looking forward to welcoming you. And then a couple of moments later, I got a uh, mail in my in-mail from a supplier who said, I can't press like on Mostafis' post because I'm too scared, because I have had orders canceled and I am supply, I'm a big, big, big supplier, and I, my business has been ruined by this, and I am trying to pay severance pay for my workers, and I can't, and I've gone to the brand, and I've told them, and they have threatened me and my life, and I have left the country, and you, if you disclose my name, if you disclose my country, it is the knife for me and my family. And this is actually not even an uncommon story. I've heard this all the time. 
This is, a, I've heard people say this is a corporate conspiracy, they're spinning up buying teams and CSR teams, they're keeping people from talking to each other, I can't share my voice. But the Environmental Audit Commission on fast fashion, one supplier contributed, and they contributed anonymously. You had all the brands, you had trade unions, everyone. We don't have enough supplier voice. And Mostafis is the bravest man I know, telling all these stories, and has taken a hit for it. Many, 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 many times. I would like to ask you, Mostafis, um, you have come up with some possible solutions um, that would that would incentivize buyers to make changes. Can you give us some ideas of what you're working? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm, uh, as Olivia said, I'm not among of that uh, uh, fearing guy. Eh? I'm always, <laughs> I think I'm the most activist guy in the whole world from that supplier. You will be seen always everywhere. And people hate my face because <laughs> I am everywhere. Tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, I'm going to Barcelona. I will be at conference. In fact, everywhere I am there. And I love to tell the truth. And all the things I try to tell the truth. That's all I, I think. Let me tell a couple of things. I'm, um, I'm listening all the things and I thought, okay, when I get time, I will tell something. Uh, Jill, you asked a question first where I didn't give my response that individual or collective. I tell you something. When in factory, safety is the most important thing for a manufacturing factory. When we make a door five feet, another guy and say, another client come and say, no, the door is not correct, you have to make six feet. And I tell him, no, we just built this door and we bought it 10,000 euro. No, if you want to work for me, this is my rules. So this means individuality. Any changes start from yourself. In my room, I always read a big post, the change starts from yourself. Don't wait for someone else and come and will change the world. It's me who gonna, I, every day morning I wake up and I say to myself, it's me who gonna change the world. It's me, Mustafa. yes. It starts from myself. So, when there is a uh, buying practices is an issue, we have to address that. If any of our, of our clients and customers, brands, retailer, we expect them to have a responsible buying practices. We don't want them to know 10,000 of buyers what they are doing or 11,000 of retailers what they are doing. We wanted whoever who working with some his partners, we wanted them, he should be trading, behaving him in a responsible way. Very simple. No need to wait for collective. It's an always excuses. And when when uh, my factory or any factory, we have 4,000 factories in Bangladesh having a problem, we don't say that, sorry, we cannot make this safety standard because other factories are not doing. <laughs> No, nobody, nobody will say this one. So this, the same thing I will also expect Jill, no need collective actions. We need to address the issue and we need to solve it. And when everybody will start to change, the change will automatically, other people will be happening uh, by themselves. This is my personal view. And uh, regarding the incentive, uh, uh, I think you asked the question that um, how can uh, we can do this one. Uh, see, my Personal thing is people ask to me, why you work so hard? Every day in the flight, if you look into my two years post, you will see almost everywhere I am going. I know I don't have to do anything, I didn't have to, but all I try to do is, I try to tell the truth and I try to bring this in front of the audience and tell them the story, which is the, the truth. So, the purchasing practices, what about the problem happening for a manufacturer I think we already addressed this issue through your event today and we need to make, uh, say for example, in Europe they can uh, make a rules, okay, if you do responsible purchasing you will be getting this amount of tax refund or this percentage of incentive you will, you will, you will get it from, uh, uh, from, from that particular government. And responding to the questions of you, my friend, about BGME and all these things in our country. See, there are a lot of legal frames out there. When I posted about blacklisted issues that I, uh, in my article, why don't we blacklist this particular buyer in our country? And when I work for that, somebody from Hong Kong uh, sent me an email, my friend, you are just wasting your time. I tried to do this many years and I could not able to do it. There are a lot of rules in European Union and the world and all these things 
which we have to follow. We as an individual country, in our country, we cannot simply blacklisted or simply can do particular things. The change has to start from this part of the of the country where the buyers and retailers are there. So if these organizations, government can have a strong eye about these purchasing practices and then they say, listen, you have this many of the complaints about this. If you do this one, next year you have to pay 5% more taxes or something like that, a reward and also punishment. Not only I'm talking about that punishment, but also some reward. But we are not addressing the issue. When we are not, I think this is the first conference ever what happening about the purchasing practices and a conversation for you guys to bring up the issue. It's only a start, I think it's a journey. So we have to address the issue. When we will address the issue more and more, then we have to find out the solution about that. That's my thinking. Um, I'm going to ask one more question of the group, and then you all feel free to ask questions of the panel. But can we have a show of hands? How many of you in the audience think that working conditions can improve without changes in purchasing practices? Working conditions can improve. And, and why or why not? Okay, so we have Olivia, we have Ivanka, Martin, and some people in the back. Okay. How many people think that working conditions cannot improve without changes in purchasing practices? So it's about an even number. <laughs> you can. Okay, so can we? I would love to hear from, I mean, I don't know. Like to say something, or Sarah, or others, can you just tell us why or why not you think that working conditions can improve regardless of, of uh, changes in purchasing practices? Can we have 